Thank you, everybody, for coming. <coughs> um, I think most of you know who I am. I'm Charles Traub, and the chairperson of MFA Photography, Video, and Related Media Program here at School of Visual Arts. And this is a series that's part of what we call our Scheinflug lecture series. And we've been doing this for many years. And I urge anybody who is stimulated by what we're doing here with this to look at our website and learn more about forthcoming events. Um, I don't know if he's here right now, but an alum, Charles Sainty, who is a creative multimedia, new media artist, called me last spring and said, I want to show you something. And I said, OK, great. Let's have lunch. And so several of us went to have lunch. And he showed us the new AI program, DALI. And OK, I kind of knew it existed. I kind of know about AI, but really not its impact upon our world of the lens and screen arts. That's the subtitle of our name of our department, lens and screen arts, because that's what we're all involved in in this day of the digital. Um, going back to 1988 when the program was formed by me, I called it photography, video, and related media. And everybody asked what related media was. And I said, well, it's whatever. But now it's really lens and screen arts. But at any rate, Charles was so enthusiastic, and he was working on it. He's going after a PhD himself in this area. And we mentioned Lev Manovich's name, among others. And I called Lev almost immediately. And I said, we want to do something next spring. He said, no, let's do it now. <laughs> I said, OK, we'll organize it now. He said, you know, this is the most important thing to happen to the lens arts since 1837. That hit me pretty hard. Or maybe you said since the invention of the camera. At any rate, a few days later, I had lunch with Fred Richen, who's in the audience, a thinker and creator and writer about these things for many years. And he said virtually the same thing. And I said, oh my goodness, I better wake up. So this is the beginning of our department's involvement with this exponentially changing issue uh, to explore it's good, it's bad, it's new, it's whatever it offers us. And I'm sure in years to come, we will kind of remember how simple it was today uh, but maybe not. Maybe we'll regret it. So Lev is going to enlighten us with Natasha Chuk uh, about where we're at now and what he thinks about it, because he's been dealing with it for many years. Natasha's going to give an at length, or more at length, introduction to Lev. And I'm going to introduce Natasha, who's sitting here. She is a faculty member, a theorist, a historian, writer about the subjects of technology. Uh, she holds a PhD from the European Graduate School. And she is the author of a book with a complicated title, but appropriate, Vanishing Points, Articulations of Death, Fragmentation, and the Unexperienced Experience of Creative Objects, which deals with all of these issues within the digital realm. She's also working on a new book uh, about the post-photography concerns. Um, she has been, she is our, our thinker about where we're at in this. And so Natasha, with no further ado, <laughs> thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you, Charlie, for that really nice introduction. Um, yeah, I am a faculty member in this department, and I'm a media theorist and arts writer. And in general, my work focuses on the relationship between art and technology, really broadly. I think of creative technologies as systems of language at the intersection of expression, interface, and perception. So I use 
really broad definitions of both technology and language. And in my work, uh, the purpose of this is to really think about language as a system of exchange. It's human made, it's got a structure and a set of rules, but we have to learn them. They're not, they're not inherent, they're not a given. They change over time, through space, and of course, for different purposes. So we adjust language accordingly to unlock the most effective ways to communicate, to document, and to express ourselves. So I'm interested in how we create uh, new languages through shifting technical systems. Visual language, the language of software, of interaction, and more recently, the language of automation. We're always pushing the limits of technology, and through that, we develop new ways of thinking about and perceiving the world around us. I'm interested in how these creative developments encourage us to push through and shift ideas about what constitutes the self, identity, objecthood, how we understand time and space, and what it means to be human. So these are big questions. I'm interested um, in this question, too, and I've been thinking about this since you know, this kind of explosion of AI uh, image generation began earlier this year, and thinking about its popularity, its accessibility, and expansion, what this all means for image making. As a medium, this new type of cameraless photography uses a combination of technologies. It's capable of simultaneous functions, and though it's relatively new, it's constantly changing. So creative AI has been around for some time now and artists experimenting with its affordances and applications, but tools like DALI, Midjourney, Stable Diffusion, and others like that offer an easy way for just about anyone to play around with these sophisticated technologies without requiring any technical expertise. Using these tools, an image can be generated by typing in a simple prompt. And it could be one word or it could be a detailed phrase or you, know, you can also use an existing image. These user-friendly tools have quickly harnessed and normalized the power and frivolity of creative artificial intelligence, with results ranging from absurd to extraordinary. All this has some of us wondering, how exactly do these tools work? Uh, what do they mean for the future of photography? And maybe more precisely, what is photographic about these tools? You know, how are these tools expanding what constitutes a photograph? Where do the images used to train these models come from? And should we be concerned about racial, gender, aesthetic, and other biases? So these are three images uh, that I generated using Dolly 2 of New York City. Um, Dolly 2 is just the upgrade to Dolly. Um, I use different years uh, in each prompt to represent the past, present, and future. The image on the left, which resembles a drawing, I uh, use the prompt New York City 1577 the middle New York City 2022, and the third New York City 2077. Each of these images is technically and ontologically the same, but only the middle image resembles a photograph. Dolly 2 didn't, or maybe couldn't, render a photographic image of a past that predates photography, and it also selected a really stylized vision of the future, perhaps to register the speculative prompt um, the speculative nature of the prompt I use in 2077. So looking at these three images, I wonder what is the difference between a photograph and simply a digital image? These cameraless images are materially equal, but visually and semiotically different, performing the aesthetics of hand drawing, photography, and computer illustration, respectively. On one hand, these differences don't really matter, but in a world of deep fakes and bots, I think it's worth thinking about how images interact with one another and get disseminated alongside their camera-generated counterparts. So I think it's also important to note that the AI in these tools, however sophisticated it might be, doesn't have awareness or consciousness or autonomy. The system doesn't know the cultural and material differences between these media. These aesthetic differences are a result of how the AI generator makes decisions. In the most simplified terms, it uses a combination of machine vision, natural language processing, and noise reduction to generate a new image based on the user's input, which again can be a text-based prompt like I used, or it can be an existing image. Each system, whether it's DALI, Midjourney, Stable Diffusion, or another, is trained on hundreds of millions of images taken from the web and other da databases um, and uses two neural networks, one to 
process uh, text and the other to analyze the generated image with reference images. The whole process involves learning the relations between the images and how they're described. Learning how to process semantics from natural language, which is ordinary everyday human speech as opposed to programming code, and learning how to read images to generate new ones. This image sort of visualizes that network of associations. I stole this from Dali's web, uh, web <laughs> demonstration. So here's another set of images I created using Dali 2, and I used the prompt photograph of Natasha Chuk. <laughs> I wasn't expecting the system to render an image of me. I was curious how it would manufacture a person who isn't me, but somehow fit this, you know, associations between existing images in the system and the combination of these words. So I typed it in and hit generate. To the system, an unpopular name like mine isn't iconic. It's not Picasso, it's not Andy Warhol. It's just text without millions of images from which to draw connections. This brief exercise was a small test for me to decipher how the system thinks. And based on these first four results, I can conclude that it struggled to resolve the racial and ethnic ambiguity of my name, but nonetheless recognized the words were related to a person, referred to someone, a name, and referred to a human being, not an object. These, of course, aren't real people. Um, you know, they're fabricated from the millions of images of people who might share parts of my name. But again, using only learned association between images and descriptions, the system can't qualify anything beyond visual representation, such as distinguish between identity and biology. While a text prompt can include any use of natural language, I think this example also illustrates the gap between a description and a command in the context of machine understanding. In her book, Artificial Unintelligence, Meredith Broussard writes, part of the communication problem that exists in computational culture derives from the imprecision of everyday language and the precision of mathematical language. And I think Dolly, too, seems to prefer something between these two languages. My text prompt was less a command and more like a suggestion. Natural language is really loose. It can't be owned or contained. Computer code, on the other hand, is designed to do exactly what you tell it to do. It's precise, while natural language is polysemous and contextual. Without supportive relations between my prompt and the system's training, these results sort of miss the mark, and my suggestion didn't go very far. So I think Lev Manovich's experiments are very different. Um, these are images from a series of images he created using Midjourney, these so-called historical fictions uh, that he's been sharing on social media for the past few months or so. I think these images test whether history can be understood through the system's unique artificially intelligent reasoning by creating images of a past he experience, experienced firsthand while at school in Moscow. I think the use of language in this series is successful in the way that it initiates what an AI photograph can be. So if you look at this prompt here, um, it's a group of, group of students uh, in the 10th grade of Russian school and then year. Um, with that last part being sort of variable. The prompt is an art form in itself, I think, because it satisfies the system, the system's preference for kind of a code-like natural language. By reducing the amount of complexity each word has and using the prompt uniformly across multiple image generations, the experiment yields the most ideal conditions for machine understanding, something my own experiments were lacking. Words in this grouping are a constant, except the year, which is variable, that X factor that can be used in a routine. And by avoiding the use of unnecessary descriptive words and unpopular proper nouns, Lev works within the machine learning system's logic and helps kind of close the gap between everyday and mathematical language. In other words, Midjourney is user-friendly enough to permit any use of natural language, but there seem to be ways to improve and tease out more interesting aesthetic results. another image. I find these images in the series really uncanny. They exhibit a temporal restlessness that hints at but doesn't commit to photographic realism. They register timescales that appear muddled in both the visual representation of people and how the photographic medium is simulated. Regardless of the year in the prompt, the past is represented in broad strokes. Their uniforms don't change, their hairstyles don't really change. The effect feels all studium and no punctum, if we're using Roland Barthes' terms, and not at all how a historical photograph normally functions. Instead, precise details feel blurred and incomplete. 
much more like a faded memory. The images in this series are imbued with what cultural theorist Mark Fisher referred to as a strange simultaneity, almost visualizing a past, present, future aesthetic of time, and an impossible timescale of homogeneity or visual repetition across the student subjects. And this is what makes the images aesthetically appealing and almost provocative in their refusal to adhere to the logic of camera photography and its cultural and historical positioning. They're not a composite of existing images of people, rather they're a remixing of what real people in this imagined time and place might look like. They confer an aesthetic of imitation and approximation, almost real people in an almost real place and time. Along with that, they're a remixing of ideas and associations between existing images and specific words in the prompt, like high school and Russian. Given the current political landscape, it's impossible not to think about how these newly generated images incorporate the present in their recreation of history. We could even say the series offers a present historical fiction reflecting a war that is currently taking place. These observations, again, push us to rethink what constitutes a photograph. Is an AI photograph really a photograph when it can conjure history, geography, and human nature from an ontological void? So to be clear, I don't believe AI will destroy photography any more than traditional photography destroyed painting or the internet made us stupid. But it's worth digging into how it's changing the way we think and create. AI generated images are dependent on diffusion, this deep learning training model centered on the elimination or reduction of noise. This to me produces an uncertain substrate, one that is subject to the highly black boxed operation of deciphering between signal and noise. This is an already familiar condition of computational photography, the camera technology we all have on our smartphones, which creates new images through an elaborate remixing of other images you've either accessed on your device or taken yourself. Sifting through potentially thousands of images, this process requires choosing between signal and noise. But who decides what is signal and what is noise? Nearly 10 years ago, Hito Steirel wrote about this, and then at that time it was a new technology, she wrote, the result might be a picture of something that never even existed, but that the algorithm thinks you might like to see. She continued to add, this whole process will increase the amount of noise, just as it will increase the amount of random interpretation. So with this in mind, we might then ask, are we creating systems that produce realistic or ideal photo objects? If it's the latter, I think that's okay. Uh, technically, these images are made from the noise of millions of poor images circulating the web and stored in image databases. I also think this is what we call post-photography. These new AI tools reflect a trajectory of technical change and demonstrate our shifting relationships to images and image-making processes. With, with that, we're thinking about how emerging technical practices shape notions of identity, visual aesthetics, memory, authorship, and creative impulses. Artists have been working with creative AI for much longer than these AI image generator generators have been around. And I think we should reflect on how their work has opened up the black box a little bit to reveal certain biases and limitations of AI. So we can continue to ask important questions about how these tools are used and continue to experiment with them and help usher the technology along. Because I don't think AI photography will replace other forms of photography. It may add new questions and maybe even new problems, but it will also inspire new aesthetic possibilities and creative partnerships, giving us yet another tool to create and be expressive. Moreover, I think this creative affordance, the ability to create new images with the assistance of AI, can help us imagine different possible futures and alternate realities. As Joanna Zielinska writes, the possibility of envisaging a different future and painting a different picture of the world may require us to extend an invitation to non-human others to join the project and help redraft its aesthetic boundaries. Pushing and expanding aesthetic boundaries, uh, literally creating new ways of seeing, has always been the aim of photography. And I think we can even take this further and stretch the ways we think about these tools to unpack the very operations of techni, the weaving and fabrication of sign systems that communicate, document, express, and generate meaning. In this way, AI, AI image generators are a hybrid form that borrow from the creative subjectivity of drawing and mark making and the technical composition but equally flexible art of written poetry. Albrecht Dürer's 16th century woodcut of a rhinoceros, pictured here, is a fitting example of this creative convergence. 
He made this work, which is highly detailed, without ever seeing a, rhin a rhinoceros himself. He based it on someone else's written description and subsequent rumors of what it looked like. The result is a semi-fantastical beast that resembles the real thing with added embellishments. As an artist, he worked with creative freedom, often evoking both things that were there and not there. Computers are the meta medium he never had, synthesizing imagination, skill, and speed to give form to an object, a person, or a place that exists in the imagination. But I'd like to bring this back to photography where we began and consider the ways that AI image generators are photographic. Newly generated images using these tools don't appear from an objective or ubiquitous origin. While they're trained on millions of images, the images they generate aren't even close to being sourced from some kind of sublime everywhere and everything. Newly generated images emerge from a set of possibilities, inescapable from the biases within the apparatus and the creators themselves. In this way, the conditions for making pictures remains the same. The parameters of the system and the preferences of the creator meet somewhere in the middle to make an image that approximates some aspect of reality. So here I'm intentionally using broad terms to reflect on the ways that creative experimentation pushes the definitions of any medium and the creative practices built around it. Man Ray, the avant-garde artist who experimented with a different kind of cameraless photography, understood this, saying, I would photograph an idea rather than an object, a dream rather than an idea. With this in mind, we're reminded that the definition of photography has always been flexible and robust. There is much more to say and eventually write about AI photography, but rather than cast doubt on its integrity as a photographic medium, I'd like to further underline the importance here of creative potential. Dali, Midjourney, Stable Diffusion, all the others, they have their limitations, but this is just the beginning. And while this new creative affordance may have started with these particular rules or way of doing things, those rules will hopefully be broken or compromised or altogether ignored. This is what happens when we endeavor to create and to be expressive. So now I'd like to turn this over to Lev, um, who will draw on his vast experience as an artist, a computer scientist, and a digital culture theorist to talk about AI photography. Um, he's written numerous books and articles, too many to mention here, um, but I'll list a few of them because they really are important to thinking about what's going on technically and theoretically with these new tools. Uh, cultural analytics, right, where he talks about the evaluation of culture essentially by using some of these tools. AI aesthetics, Instagram and contemporary image, and the language of new media, which might be my favorite. Uh, one of the earliest books that I still use, I still find relevant in the classroom and in my own work. So please welcome Dr. Lev Manovich. Good evening. Um, so we have this auditorium until nine o'clock. So I will give my half an hour talk and then me and Natasha will discuss. And then I hope we'll have some wonderful discussion with audience because I'm very happy to see both young students here who represent the future and also some of the best thinkers of our time <laughs> about photography, media and technology. And uh, to get a question from any of you would be a real honor. Uh, so before proceeding with my talk, I want to thank everybody you know, who organized it. It was the most professional organization I have ever seen. So Natasha, Adam, uh, Charles, and also you know, people who work at the theater. And one more preface. Mm, so I think uh, Charles said, perhaps you know, a bit lightly in his introduction, that Natasha is going to give an introduction to me. Actually, I'm going to, I'm going to give footnote to her talk because I think her talk was absolutely brilliant. It's the best thing, <laughs> written, best thing written about this new development I have seen. And you know, we didn't discuss what each of us is going to talk, but um, I think you made ever all points I'm going to make, at least two of them. Like I also use BART, et cetera. And uh, I think, so nobody's stealing from anybody, but the convergences are amazing. And the last thing I want to say, you know, I, I'm taking this so seriously, uh, is, yeah, I don't get to speak in New York in person every day. Uh, it's, such a, right, it's such a kind of privilege now to do something physically. So I actually written my talk and I'm going to read it, which is something I haven't done since my student days. So as a result, it may be a bit monotonous, 
but then we'll go to the cheers, and if you want the usual provocative, sarcastic laugh, you know, yeah, you can, you can definitely unleash the beast, okay? So just bear with me, okay? Um, so as most of you know, uh, this particular media revolution, which is AI image synthesis, you know, has been in the making for at least 20 years, but things really took off this summer. Uh, so mid, uh, mid journey, small startup released their beta version to invited users in February, and then in July, you know, it became open to, ev to everybody. And then in August, um, Stability AI refused their own ver uh, released their own version of an uh, interface to a similar model, and we also ma made model open source. So now there are dozens of tools uh, which all do similar things, but produce slightly different results. There's already a plugin for Photoshop, and uh, you know, from what I learned tonight, uh, a version of this tool will be available in the next version of Photoshop. Still, oops, sorry, still, um, it was sort of amazing right, how much attention this generated in the most respected news media, so a pivotal, and uh, you know, normally we kind of, right, normally we don't take this, this claim seriously because we say, well, it comes from industry, industry always hypes itself off, but we have very serious people, right? So Financial Times called this a pivotal moment in the history of art. New York Magazine uh, talked about this technology and said how we can work, even think changes when we can instantly comment, convincing images into existence, and uh, our New York Times, which is usually so critical, right, about technology because its target audience is like, I think people who are 70 plus live in Upper West Side, so they're always cr they're critical. They also, like, they also jo join the hype by saying image generators uh, have made it possible for anyone, so I, ca I highlighted the words in red, which I, which I think problematic, right? for anyone to create unique, anyone is okay, but unique part is definitely problematic, uh, hyper-realistic images just by typing a few words into a text box. Okay. Uh, so I think most people here know how it works. Uh, my examples come from Midjourney because that's the service I use most, although these days I also use stable diffusion, uh, but most of my points are too general, uh, but there's a particular reason why I'm using sort of Midjourney for my examples, so, right, so those of you who are new to that, uh, you register on Midjourney website, and then you go to the Discord server. So Discord is a kind of form of social media. And then uh, you kind of type a text prompt, such as all page of fantasy castle, ta, ta, ta. The system gives you four images. If you like a particular image, you can ask it to render it in a high resolution. But what's amazing about uh, this particular system, and this is why my journey is so interesting, is you see what everybody else is typing at the same time, right? So it's probably the first time in the history of digital media when you can kind of watch hundreds of thousands of users uh, inventing, copying each other, uh, creating new things, and the way you learn, right? You kind of see what people type, you see which images come out, and the way I was also learning when I started in July, right? I would just copy somebody prompt and run it again, and then I would start modifying it, and uh, the journey said that we wanted users to co-create, we wanted to see quick evolution, and this is why we made uh, software available only for this interface. Uh, okay. uh, and uh, as you know, already Natasha mentioned, right, uh, the system knows about practically every you know, older <laughs> uh, existing media, so you can vary results you know, from Hollywood film to a drawing to gravure to watercolor. And uh, the prompts can be very short. I'll show you later examples where I'm testing the system by giving it prompts which are just one word. But the prompts can be also very long. And you notice that exactly as Natasha already told you, so sorry to repeat what you said, um, the text become a kind of code, right? A kind of structured code to the image. But what's also important, it's a model of code, right? So it's almost like a language, particular language, al almost like programming language where you separate you know, the medium, photographic portrait, a content, uh, you know, dancer, ta, 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 and when you put like atmospheric effects, fog, and when you talk about photographic parameters, and you also notice that in this prompt, 90, 95% of the prompt, the words are about aesthetics and media as opposed to content. And this is not accidental, I'll discuss it in a second. 
Um, so again, give you more examples. So this is from Instagram. Uh, you know, you can do anything with this. I mean, you can, not anything, but you can visualize you know, thousands of different things with tools. But as it often happens in a popular culture, uh, you know, what people generate, so this is like most recent mid-journey images on Instagram, uh, is not reflection of what system can or can do, it's rather a reflection of particular popular taste of the users. So if you see certain similarity to what you'll find on uh, Deviant Art site, Art Station, I think it's not accidental. Uh, but it's also used, you know, by already all kinds of professionals. So for example, you know, there are some you know, very renowned architecture theorists and architecture schools which use it. So here we have these more fantastic images of architecture, but people also use it to invent new textures, new facades. You know, I've been at the symposium a month ago, which was like all about using it in architecture education. And uh, although I think so far, uh, as I said, right, the taste of most users, it's, it's very hard to define what it is, right? So we can say it's concept art, right? So concept artists, we're not concept artists, right? Like in the art world, concept artists, it's a, it's a professionals in creative industry who create characters, backgrounds, uh, kind of setups for video games, uh, you know, films, illustrations, etc. right? Um, so from what I see, right, this is much more similar to divine art than something else. Uh, and partly it's also because until very recently, you know, the, the systems couldn't really generate very convincing photographs and the people looked, right, a bit problematic, but it's all changing. Um, and so this is like a slide I found very recently, which uh, generate, and this is DALI E, which is uh, many people think is actually the weakest system from all of them because it is too realistic, but it's also in a way too photographic. So this is the kind of photographic effects, right? Uh, you can simulate, so examples of different type of, right? Synthetic photography you can make, something from a professional photo portrait to kind of black and white uh, to uh, even Polaroids. And to me, it looks quite convincing. So in my talk, um, I want to briefly develop or introduce four ideas. Yeah, image synthesis as a media effect. Text is called environmental copy. Image text relationship in AI image synthesis with reference to Roland Bart and feedback loops and aesthetic biases. So first, AI image synthesis is a form of media art. Mid-journey, stable diffusion and other AI image synthesis tools are only possible after enough images of artworks, illustrations, concept art, video game art, Hollywood films and so on have become available on the internet. And they can be used to train a very big neural network. So some of the systems use like 700, 800 million images. And the stable diffusion models uses a data set, which is 5.5 billion image and text pairs. And in the images of content, the immediate images, you know, we simply didn't exist in these quantities, you know, even 15 years ago. So this is why I think such tools could not exist 15 years ago, because the masses of digitized cultural images and all the new visual publications and things like Demon Art, Art Station, and so on, Behance, you know, we're not online yet or we're not so rich, not only because you couldn't train such a big network 15 years ago. Now, uh, so this is, uh, I think this is, uh, comes from a uh, guide to Dali E, so it's from the summer. So things are already changing, like if you now use Midjourney, the structure approach differently. So this is from like one of many online kind of guidebooks some users created to help you to use uh, DALI E. And uh, so this is a section about photography and they give you examples, right, of how to structure a photographic prompt. Um, so that's the things I discussed, right? So framing, film type, shoot context, and then you just put your subject um, and then you can even put 1973 photo from Life magazine, uh, dramatic backlighting, and so on. And as you saw, sometimes these prompts run like six, seven, eight, ten lines long. So what's interesting here, the on the first hand, it looks very natural, but it is also a bit peculiar that like in real life prompts, the subject part can be just a few words. So as I said, 80 or 90% of a prompt is description of aesthetics and particularly media effects. Uh, so I would like to claim that at least in its current state, yeah, image generation is a form of media art <laughs> because lots of images 
users create really use media statics as its main content, right? So if you look at this, of course, people want to create, you know, particular things, but I think the delight the users find and the delight the users find in how well the computer simulates the effects of the different media is to a large extent, I think, why we enjoy it and why these tools have become so popular, right? Um, so this is more examples from the same guidebook, right? And this is from the summer, now you can do better. So different examples, right, of, right, of uh, if you specify these terms, you should get, you know, various film types, stocks and processes. You can also get various illustration styles, analog media, monochrome, uh, like I've been using lots of prompts with uh, terms like gravure or etching. And of course, it can also simulate styles of hundreds of artists in different periods in our history. Um, so again, these are the examples, right, of how powerful are the systems in terms of uh, simulating a kind of all kinds of media effects. And there is something else, you know, because, right, because Natasha mentioned cultural analytics, I thought I should put one graph into the talk. So what we've done uh, between middle of July and middle of September is we ran four times to Midjourney Discord server, and my assistant have collected you know, a few hundred prompts randomly each time. So we created a database of 600 prompts, and here you see this database loaded in a popular uh, online open source text analysis tools called Vayor, and I'm now completing a whole article based on the kind of you know, quantitative analysis of mid-journey prompts, but here I just want to point one thing, right? So if you look at the window on the left, it basically rates all the unique terms which appear in these prompts by popularity. And then in the center, right, you have the same thing as visualization. So if you can see, right, first 20 or 25 most popular terms are all about aesthetics, they're all about media, right? Render, realistic, portrait, detailed, octane, lighting, style, white, and then eyes and girl <laughs> and space are much smaller, right? So again, maybe you can say I'm like a bit like stretching things to make an argument, but nevertheless, I was really struck by the, uh, how much this simulating of media is important to this uh, new thing. And what is this new thing, right? So what exactly is you know, AI image synthesis? Is it a new photography, it's a new painting? Yes, but it's also something else. Uh, in my 2013 book, um, uh, Software Takes Command, I have claimed, following Alan Kay, that computer is not a simply another media, but it's a meta media, because it can simulate most of media which came before, and also users can, uh, users can kind of program it, right, or develop it, new media. For example, VR, right, 3D computer graphics, uh, you know, metaverses. And I think that yeah, image synthesis the Pacific is not a particular media, it's a meta media because it can simulate hundreds of different things, right? In fact, AI yeah, image synthesis extends this idea of meta media further. It can simulate effects of numerous artistic media, but also it has a kind of knowledge, right? Of culture, themes, topics, ideas, and stereotypes encoded today online in billions of digital image and text pairs. So next section, text is code and the art of a copy. So AI yeah, image synthesis can be called the art of copying. You endlessly repeat the generation process, right, typing the same prompt, hoping to see improvement from the first image, and you can also see others copying and using your prompt. So when I start using the system, I realize at the moment I generate really good images, minutes later I see somebody else typing you know, the same prompt as I use, copying me, and of course I do the same. And what's also important, right, because the prompts have modular structure, I don't have to copy the whole thing, I can just copy particular parts, right, if I want to get particular effect. And this can be uh, terms related to content, you know, position of camera, atmosphere, and so on. <coughs> so it's also uh, the art of copying, right? I mean, I call, I call this culture, right? Uh, image synthesis culture, you know, the art of copying in a different sense, because of course users constantly refer to various artists, video games, Hollywood films, animation uh, studios, and web prompts. And this is, uh, I just went today, right, to the, uh, this is not Midjourney, this is Deviant Art, right? The first very popular site for non-professional artists, which went online in 2001. Uh, we have published a paper 
long time ago, analyzing one million images from this network, which has hundreds of millions of users. You know, in this uh, sum of, of, of actually hundreds of categories we have, digital art, fantasy, but if you look at the aesthetics, right, if you look at the rendering, it's kind of similar to what people do with mid-journey stable diffusion and so on, right? So while you can use the systems in any way you want, and I think as more photographers start using them, you know, we'll see different things. When you go to Instagram and you tap me journey art, you know, what you get is kind of what's done by silent majority, right? And in fact, it's the aesthetics, I think, is very similar, right? Uh, how to describe it precisely, it's a different thing. So then the question becomes, right, if um, this whole thing about kind of copying and pasting uh, and also uh, being influenced by popular culture, how is it different from uh, what we always have? So how is it different from all traditional cultures, which were always about making copies or variations of small nuggle images, right? So here, you know, we have, uh, at least as, at least as I went to Divine Art, and I type Blade Runner, and there are, you know, hundreds of images, right, where people inspired by Blade Runner and try to generate different renderings. And of course, you know, making copies and making variations of these copies was always the basis of human culture, uh, so this is the original, right, Peter Bruegel the Elder, who was the head of the whole Bruegel family, and because Bruegel you know, was already so famous and so popular in his time, you know, his whole family spent, <laughs> spent right, uh, their time making copies of his paintings, right? So this is the original, uh, the peasant wedding, and this is one of the numerous copies uh, made by, you know, uh, Peter Bruegel the Younger. And the reason you don't see, the reason when you go to museum, right, Momo and Matt, you don't get this idea because I think museums, they kind of uh, give us a sense of art history, very modernistic, right? So art history is a, is a progress, as a, you know, as a uh, history of innovations, right? Inventing new forms, but in reality, if you look at the masses of, you know, gra you know gravures and etchings in all kinds of works on paper, in paintings and frescoes, you know, or uh, throughout human history, most of the copies, copies or variations of copies, right? So when you go to museum, when you open the art textbook, it's a completely false history, right? It's only history of when somebody invented something. So the question becomes, you know, how is this, uh, you know, majority thing, uh, image snippets, how is it different? Uh, right? So uh, as Natasha already said, uh, anticipating what I would say, <laughs> Uh, in AI text to image synthesis, an image is generated by a kind of code, a text prompt. So people can see what others are typing, and images being generated, and they can copy and immediately reuse these prompts. So this is how users learn, and this is also how I learn. So rather than tracing existing images, which is how normally uh, you, know, you can copy, for example, with analog or digital tools, uh, or assembling kind of sources, right, other images in Photoshop. Now, I mean, one of the, let's say, small innovations of this AI yeah, image synthesis culture, it gives you a new way of copying, right? So you can copy and modify by using other prompts. And modularity of prompts also encourages, I think, experimentation and exploration of variations. Because a prompt is modular, you can only copy the part describing the aesthetics or composition or feature of character. Now, you can say left, you know, but this majority uh, thing is unique because it's only one of the tools where people can see what other people are typing, not at all, right? So you have uh, both like free and already commercial <laughs> databases with millions of, millions of images and their prompts. So some people collect them, you know, because people donate these images. And then there are also services where you can actually buy prompts. So this is you know, one of many uh, search engines for AI, for AI synthetic images uh, called Lexica. So here I type in the search bar today comic book panels, right? And I get almost 3,000 images. Uh, and then what I can do, like, you know, any image I like, I can see what prompt was used. Right? I can see what prompt was used, right? And then I can use it in my own generation. And not only that, but if I, if I click on explore the style, Lexica will bring you more images uh, which were you know, generated in the same style, and you can see kind of what prompts we use, right? So this idea of copying and pasting, Right, not uh, by tracing, not by you know going to museum and kind of making painting from old master, uh, not by copying somebody somebody else uh, Lightroom uh, modifications, but by copying by seeing the image and then figuring out what prompt was used and copying this prompt. You know, 
I'm not saying it's radically different, but it's a kind of new form of copying and modification which this culture introduces. Okay. Next, uh, of course, you know, we have to talk about Roland Barthes, right? For decades, we assume that describing the image by words is limiting. This was one of the most important assumptions of art in the modern era. For example, one of the key goals of visual modernism was to get rid of a story, of a narrative, having instead paintings explore their own visual languages. This is why Untitled became a very common title for modern artworks, right? Because you don't want to use language to name what's inside painting. Uh, refusing semantic labels, uh, that may limit what a viewer could see in the image. Now, this idea was not limited to the arts. Uh, in the early 60s, Roland Barthes suggested that newspaper text captions fix the meaning of newspaper photographs, limiting its potential ambiguity, right? So he suggested that, that visual images, especially photographs, are potentially ambiguous. It's not really quite clear what it is we show. So the newspapers and our TV and internet use captions, right, or voiceovers to tell you exactly, actually, what you have to see in these images. And this idea, you know, really, I think, became taken for granted in humanities and arts. However, now we have something else. When I use AI image tools, my experience is very different, right? Because when I type, right, when I type uh, a particular prompt, okay, uh, let's say this one, the software in a way amplifies my phrase, generating nuances, details, atmospheres, meanings, associations, and moods you didn't specify and often would never imagine, right? So in a paradoxical way, uh, I mean, I think while what Roland Barthes said, and I think Natasha also alluded to that, still holds, but in terms of creating things, right, in terms of experience you know, of creating things with the software, it's kind of opposite, right, where the software amplifies your text prompt and generates all kinds of information. There's, let's say there's more information in any of these images than in the prompt, right? We have a strange kind of like structure, almost architectural structure, where are particular highlights, right? So this is not in the text. So the system, in fact, amplifies it. Uh, and also, right, uh, what I can do, right, is that uh, I can run, right, the same prompt over and over, and every time the system will generate new images. So when I sh first started playing with the journey, uh, so the images are a bit crude because it was mid-July, I did this experiment, right? You know, I created some prompt which generated more or less something which looks, I think, like a believable modernist uh, figurative painting with still life, something like this. Right? And when I kept running the same prompt, I generated over 200, and I was amazed, right? So it's exactly the same text, exactly the same phrase, gave rise to hundreds of images, and as a, as a painter who started to study painting when I was 12, I can tell you, if I can paint this image, I'll be very happy. I think it's a very decent 20th century painting, and every one, every image the system generate would have this beautiful composition, and the colors would be balanced, and every one was different, right? So this was one, this was the second one. So eventually I assembled one in a kind of montage. So this is, you know, um, I think 24 images. Each one is good. And then this is, you know, more. This is, I think, 200. And we all were born from the same text prompt. So this is what I mean by a strange reversal. Okay, finally we come to the last section. Uh, oh, it's four. I'm sorry why it's five. I got too excited. Which is maybe most important. Yeah, okay, here we go. Uh, oh, okay. So although uh, we were trained on very large and diverse data sets, some AI image synthesis tools have strong aesthetic and content biases. I say some because, you know, there's like, you know, dozens of implementations of these models now, and I haven't tested all of them, so I don't want to make this argument, right, about all of them, uh, but let's say, I use stable diffusion, right? I use Midjourney, I haven't really used Dali E, and I, and, I, and I always do my research by watching hundreds of videos uh, in which people produce about how they use it or give you tips on YouTube. So I have some idea, but everything I'm saying in this talk based on my own experience, like many other people, between mid-July and mid-September, I generated something like 6,000 images. I was on Midjourney every day, uh, and this gave rise to the ideas in this talk. Okay, so, um, so what happens is that unless you define 
your own, dire your own direction, your own aesthetics, by specifying very particular terms in a prompt, some tools, and especially in journey, use their own artistic language. In fact, in an interview uh, with, with um, uh, I think, Verge, uh, David, who is the CEO of Midjourney, who before was uh, running another very interesting software company, Leap Motion, right? So he comes from creative software, uh, said that, well, you know, we, we do have a default aesthetics, right? So if you don't specify, but he, he, didn't, he refused to specify it exactly, but when people pushed him, he said, well, you know, like what colors would you get if you don't put colors? He said, well, probably you're going to get orange and greenish blue. And of course we know that this is the most stereotypical uh, uh, color scheme used in Hollywood, right, for, uh, for post-production. Uh, so that's very telling. So now I will maybe shock you uh, by actually showing you how you can make your own experiments to tease out the aesthetic biases and this language built into the system. And uh, I will show you uh, using the journey version four, but when I did this experiment a couple of days ago, you can switch between different model versions, right? So I tried one, two, three. Like the effects were different, right? So four is more realistic, but the degree of sterilization, the fact that you don't get a photograph, but you get something very, very aesthetically different, are present all of them. So this is what I do, like, right? This is how you can tease out the system. I mean, of course, we're like computer scientists in the last few years invented very systematic ways to, you know, to test out, to tease out biases from different data sets. Once, you know, this, uh, once this uh, question, you know, was publicized by media, so there are ways to do it, but this is my own informal way, you can do it yourself. So go to your favorite generator and type something simple, like sky, this is what you get. So that's what you, this is how, this is the default sky according to Midjourney, right? If this is not the aesthetic bias, then I don't know what this, right? I mean, and the thing is, what's interesting, we can talk about it, uh, right, in the, in the, you know, in, in the discussion, it's kind of hard to exactly define it, right? It's video game, it's anime, it's even stronger, it's more aestheticized with Hollywood, it's very dramatic, you see, right, with warm and cold colors, so very kind of textbook, textbook aesthetics, and it's super strong, and I rendered one of these images in detail, so you can see, right, this is what you get, right? Uh, here it actually does look a bit more like a real sunset, but, you know, even in Bali, I haven't seen such intense sunsets, right? So this is exaggerated. So now you say, lab, okay, it's a sky, but let's, let's try, let's try, let's tease out what the system do if you give it something very simple, a cube or a sphere. So what do you think, how do you think, what do you think the journey is going to render if you ask it to render a sphere? Are you guys ready? Here we go. Okay? <laughs> I mean, I think I think I proved, my, I, think I, I think I made my point. Uh, so, so this is one thing. And what I want to do, like, do I still have five minutes? Yeah, well, I, I want to, um, so I wanted to investigate a bit about, uh, you know, where do these biases or preferences, I mean, I don't want to use the word bias all the time, right? Let's say preferences. Uh, where do we come from? Well, so in the case of Midjourney, right, you know, we don't tell us exactly uh, what database we use, you know, but the, the CEO have hinted that they have built some, like, kind of visual language. And I think what also happens is that, you know, we have weekly, uh, what he calls office hours, and the CEO of the company, David, he holds them, and we listen to their users. And the system is also watching what the users produce. So either by watching automatically, we kind of prompts people are typing, and or, or by listening to what people said, I think in the latest version, like it's much more realistic, but it's also, the, the default aesthetic is very strong. So it's actually much harder, so what I'm you know, experimenting with version four in the last few days, like on the one hand, I can produce much more realistic coherent images, but this aesthetic language, which is built in so strong, but I have to work very, very hard to kind of get it out, right? It almost reminds me when I was living in LA, right? LA is not just about Hollywood, there's like architecture circles and art circles, but every time I go to a party, there would be at least one Hollywood person who would just poison the whole, the whole party, right? <laughs> like you couldn't get rid of them. And I think the same thing happens here. Uh, but uh, in the case of stable diffusion, uh, we can actually do something else. So the stable diffusion uh, model, which was released by Stability AI into the open, uh, it was trained on the subsets, on the subsets of this line data set uh, created by German computer scientists and funded by the company. So the data set is also available and open. 
it's a 5.8 billion, 5.8 billion uh, images and descriptions scraped from all over internet. So uh, to train the, the network, right, uh, which is the model of a net neural network which is behind stable diffusion, we use different subset of the data sets, but then, uh, and don't ask me, don't ask me like what it means technically because I myself not sure, like the last stages of training to kind of fine tune the network, we used a particular subset of this data set which is about a few hundred million images which is called Lyon aesthetics. So what is it? Uh, like a, on the website, we explain the whole story because the research in computational aesthetics starts already in 2006, but very briefly, so we started by uh, showing a bunch of people, different images, and when people were asked to rate these images in terms of their aesthetics, in terms of how good the images are, on a scale of one to 10, we started with 5,000 images, then we generated more prompts, then we invited people to rate them again. So eventually we got to, I think, a few hundred thousand images. Even with images we used to train now automatic neural network, and now you can show it in an image and it will predict supposedly uh, how good or how aesthetic it is to the normal average users. Of course, what's the average user? Like, it depends who these people who are evaluating. You know, these models also exist outside, right? Uh, I, I know there's at least one major stock, how, uh, you know, stock, stock photography, stock footage website where like if you pay for professional subscription, you can also specify aesthetics, so it's not limited, okay? So I said, great, so uh, let's look at the data set and let's see what, uh, what, how the model rates it. And again, the model I will talk about later, like who are these people, right, who gave us original aesthetic um, evaluations. Uh, basically, they say themselves on the website, we call them weird. Weird means Western, <laughs> educated, living in a democratic country, and actually mostly technical enthusiasts, because I think if you ask the same questions of NYU PhD art history students or SV digital art students, you'll get something else. So in a way, I think it's a reflection of like a very popular taste. So, let's, so now let's look how model evaluates images from this data set of few hundred million images, and, and uh, zero means, right, it's least successful image, and 10 means it's more successful, okay? So this is all online, you can do it yourself. So when we start at zero, one, you know, like, you know, who said those images are not successful, right, or anesthetic? It's already a particular judgment. So lots of it is text, right, but, you know, maybe fonts are not very interesting, not very good composition, or they're blurred. So when we keep, like, I basically was scrolling down this, this very long web page, and then just making screenshots for you. So when we get to three, right, now the images have a bit more composition, there is more contrast, we use negative space, um, and we notice that mostly it's actually graphic design, right? Like average graphic design, but the model who is trying to simulate what people think, think these images are aesthetically more successful. So when we keep, we keep going down, and now we get to five, six, and now we get tons of photography. And you notice it's a very particular photography, right? It's not European modernism between the wars, it's not photojournalism, it's not, you know, it's not a copy art, it's a so-called commercial photography, it's a particular photo genres, uh, right, you know, food, portrait, and so on. Uh, we also recognize particular tropes, so typically the subject is in the center, you know, sometimes there are perspectival lines leading to the center, so these photographs are very easy to read, and I have something else to say about them. And I thought, well, where's the paintings, right? Because the systems are so successful in generating painting effects. So, is that, so it turns out, this, the model, the neural network, rated the paintings, particular painting, as the most aesthetically pleasing, as the most successful, which supposedly reflects the judgments of popular people. So for popular taste, painting is more aesthetic than photography, which is also very interesting, right? Very ideological. So this is what you get, right? So now you, start, you still get photography, and you also start getting a bit of painting. And finally, these were images which were like rated the highest, right? So it's images you'll find in a, in a kind of commercial art gallery in any city uh, on this planet, but you wouldn't find them in the moment, right? And because we would, we would call them you know, popular, you know, banal, stereotypical, uh, kitsch, and so on. Um, so I want to just say a few, few, few more words about it. So we notice there's an interesting progression in ratings, right? So first we get just kind of random screenshots of some text. Then we get graphic design. So graphic design is seen not very aesthetic. 
when in the middle we get ported a product in our commercial photo genres, it's in the middle, and finally, the most aesthetics uh, are supposedly particular kind of paintings. Now, does this reflect contemporary popular taste? So people, presumably without any art or art theory training, think of popular painting as most aesthetic, whereas commercial photographs are less aesthetic, and graphic design as the least aesthetic. Well, so I think, right, this is not about visual pleasure, but I think this is about ideology, because apparently for many people in our culture, aesthetics, the term aesthetics is associated more with arts and high art than something else, which is kind of weird, right? Because you know, in the last few years, like the term aesthetics has started to be used by young people as synonymous with style, right? So you go to Google, you can type like Dark Academy aesthetics, you know, this aesthetic, this aesthetic, but apparently people who are rating these images are not with young content creators. Um, so I also noticed that many of these images have perspective lines leading to a key object of interest, and this is one of the most common composition in commercial art. Um, so images are very diverse, and certainly we don't have a single look, right? Uh, but do we have something in common, right? Is there something in common between this, kind of this, and this, right? Which are images, which was an aesthetic model predicted to be, right, most visually appealing, uh, and then this is, of course, influences this default visual language and uh, the defaults which uh, the system use, such as the stable diffusion model, uh, when you generate your own images. Is there something in common? I think there is. Um, I call, right, so I think that many of these images have very clear, so I, I think all these images are examples of contemporary visual communication. And I use the word communication, right, in a very kind of naive, simplistic, almost 50s, right, point of view, uh, where communication was the transmission of messages, right, from point A to, to point B, as opposed to later ideas where, you know, people like Stuart Hall said, you know, that the users can kind of, uh, put their own messages or misinterpret on purpose. So this is, a but you know, this is what advertising, right? Uh, mass culture, lots of Instagram accounts in popular painting does. We want to communicate something clearly, right? So uh, the images are uh, clean, dramatic, high contrast, high saturation. And in my case, uh, I, I can make very different images with these tools, but I will give you a bit of a secret. I use, the terms I use in my prompts are melancholic, depressing, desaturated, <laughs> mist, fog, early morning light, winter season. Okay, so, um, so this is the end of my talk, and uh, now we'll have a discussion. Thank you. This is like BBC, right? Like BBC from the 60s. Look, I mean, look at this thing. It's so classy, right? Um. Okay. Well, that was that was really great. Thank you. No, just a footnote. Just footnote to you. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, one thing I want to point out that I find really interesting is that I think this often happens with any new technology. Uh, we each conducted a bunch of experiments. You did way more than I did. But, but I think testing the system, like what can it do, trying to break it almost, trying to see what it can't do, um, is always, always like a really interesting exercise. It's easy to break it because it's like, it's, it, in the beginning it was very rarely working. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> So yeah. you don't have to work hard to break it. But maybe like, sure. try to tease it, try to use it against the grain. Maybe, yeah. Right, yeah. exactly. Yes, not break it, but break <laughs> down some of the problems, yeah, exactly, let's say. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So I want to start with the last the Lion Aesthetics, um, because I did a little digging around too okay. on their website. And um, so I find it really interesting, especially in the context of like open source, which always sounds like a really great idea. Like we're offering it to the public, they can manipulate however they see fit. Um, and all of this I think is really interesting. Um, they, I'm wondering if there are any downsides to making models data sets and code reusable without the need to train from scratch, which is one of the things that they want to do, right, is to make it available to people so that there's this starting point. You don't have to train your models on your own. You cut out that amount of time, and they talk about energy efficiency and computer resources and things like that. And I wonder this, um, 
in terms of avoiding the feedback loop that we clearly right. identified here, yes. and and any like problematic elements to that data set, yep. um, however we're defining it, or incomplete um, aspects, biased aspects, um, preferences, as you call them. Yep. Are there any downsides to that? Or, or can you imagine, because it's open source, we can just fill in those gaps? Yeah. OK. Well, so one thing I want to say first, right, is this kind of feedback loop where people search for particular things or like particular things. People express their preferences in a specific way online. Even the algorithms pick it up, right? It also works on Instagram. I think it also works you know, in uh, you know, Google search and so on. Uh, Instagram, like if you write, when you go to the Instagram recommendation page, of course, it will try to recommend things, similar subjects or hashtags to what you like you know, to look at, but the aesthetics will be similar, right? It's almost impossible to see bad images. The images are way too spectacular, right? Uh, so in fact, I think Instagram, in a way, this bias is even stronger. But it's also interesting here how I think first and second version of Midjourney, you know, the system was less capable, but this kind of bias was also more weak. So as the system becomes capable of generating much more realistic, detailed, and also 3D coherent images, like it's almost like we're you know, increasing bias because I think we see how people use it. Um, so the thing about open source, right? So you know, if you look at the kind of underbelly, right, of contemporary digital culture, you know, Facebook, you know, Google, I mean, all the big companies release a very big part of their software is open source. Because we did realize at a certain point that if we want to see innovation, you know, there are dozens or hundreds of our teams working on particular software. So software for, you know, big databases, you know, Hadoop, all the stuff, is, right, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that's a good thing. Um, now, what you can do with the systems, right? And unfortunately, you know, when I had a choice between spending a few months or maybe half a year and really learning mathematics of the systems, which I know would take me quite a while, and understanding those details, and actually making some drawings, I decided to make some drawings. And now it's a problem because I can't really give you a good answer to your question. Uh, but here it is, right? So when you have a system which is already pre-trained, uh, you know, before ImageNet was the same thing, we found out that but if you want the system to do something else, if you want the system, for example, to recognize different kind of images, so ImageNet was this huge database uh, for image recognition, right? Or if you want the system to generate new images, it is much more efficient to start with a network, which has already been trained, and then you can kind of fine tune it on your own images. And I've seen like examples where somebody would take this network and then give it seriously just five of my photographs, and the system starts generating something which is not exactly like me, but sometimes I see myself. Now, what are, the what are the drawbacks of this? I can't say exactly because I haven't digged. But uh, one computer science colleague said, Lev, this is problematic because this kind of unconscious, so to speak, right? This unconscious, we have huge network which already was trained. When you put something on top of it, you kind of fine tune it to do something else, but this unconscious will be still there. Uh, and I can't go beyond that uh, because, again, I haven't tried it. Myself. Yeah. Well, ImageNet yeah, is somebody knows problematic as well. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so it's it's important to point that out that these these systems are problematic, and I think it requires some literacy, some education around like why why are they problematic, asking questions about why they're problematic, and I think because the tools are so easy to use and relatively mindless, especially with yeah. the copy and pasting functions and practices, as that becomes increasingly popular, I think. You know, we're less likely likely to ask questions. Um, so that's why I was interested in that question about the nature of the open source yeah. component and how that's going to change beyond sure. the biases that are already existing with the people who are using it in this kind of, you know, the beta testers, if you will, and then the first wave. I think you're absolutely right. Like, as normal users, I'm not going to be asking questions. We're just happy that you have such a beautiful image, you know, from nothing. But I think with society, the New York Times, the sober world, you know, the responsible computer scientists will be asking those questions. So just as people eventually ask questions about ImageNet, and computer scientists had to respond, you know, to this intense pressure we got from media after 2016, and they very quickly, you know, they're smart people, right? They very quickly developed tools which allow you to audit any data set and see what biases. I think we'll see professional community do it as well. And what I'm also hoping to see, and I think it will happen, you know, now you just have like one model which is trained with huge, you know, uh, five billion image text pairs. But I think, and it did cost, I think, a few hundred thousand dollars to train it. Uh, but I think that, 
you know, very soon, within a year or two years, we'll see other models which are trained on a small data sets uh, where you can actually audit. Because auditing, right, trying to figure out what's inside six billion images, right, it's actually very difficult even for computer, right? So, uh, right? so I think that as the systems, you know, is there are more models, uh, because what's important is not to have bias. Bias can be a good thing. I will explain why. What's important is to know what the bias is, right? So as long as the data sets and models are published and saying this is what it is, we know it can do this, you know, this is the ethnicity of people or types of aesthetics which it was trained on. But then, of course, you know, ethnicities are easy. How do we name all these different aesthetics? Our art theory doesn't have a language, right? So I was struggling to say, well, it's kind of anime, it's kind of fantasy, it's kind of Hollywood. Uh, but now let me, because I promised to be controversial, uh, let me uh, give you an example why biases are, can be good. So I was told by uh, uh, Roger Molina, who's the editor of Leonardo, that he was invited to uh, participate in a large architecture competition in China. And you know, when you think about China, it's like our world multiplied by 20, right? So like thousands and thousands of teams uh, submitted by project to this competition. So we realized, that, you know, whereas here we get 200 projects, we got like 5,000. So it was impossible to judge. So we develop AI. Well, to judge projects of this architectural competition, and because we don't, we didn't want it only teams from Shanghai, Beijing to win. We, we put a bias, so it will basically, you know, try to uh, while to try to choose best projects, it will also try to choose projects from different regions and from big and small cities, right? So it's an example of bias which can be good as long as you know why it's there. Right, right. In that example, that makes sense. Um, and, and it reflects the, the bias of the judges, obviously. Well, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that's easy to see. Yes, when it's transparent, I think it's OK. It's like, I want to know what, what the origin is. I want to know what those, what the data, set, what the data sets entail. Um, and so far, that hasn't really been clear, although you know it is just the beginning. Yeah. Um, so I wanted, I don't know, we talked a little bit about this, you and I, about the quality of the images going into these data sets. And I think that's really interesting, especially because you were talking about this kind of art of the copy and this aesthetic of copying and, and repetition in general. And it made me think about memes um, and just kind of meme culture and the generation of these images and text, you know, sometimes combined with text uh, that circulate online. And I wondered, like, those types of images are not being scraped from the web to be included in these data sets, or are they, or we don't know? I think, uh, you know, I think within this, when you scrape six billion images, you have no idea what's inside. Right. So the scientists don't know, but I think already I heard that, uh, for example, Mid Journey, Stable Diffusion people, we realize that to go forward, to, to improve our models, we actually have to go and clean up our data sets, so we actually will have to look inside, right? Because as you saw, data sets have all kinds of stuff, uh, although you don't want to have examples. We basically, what we've done, what I didn't explain, right? So this aesthetic model was run over, uh, like I think, the whole data set, and then for training, we only selected images which got score five or higher, right? We score five, five. And we, we saw that for certain cultural reasons, Paintings, particular kind of paintings, let's say kitsch painting, although this is a judgment, were rated much higher than photographs, which is also very interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think, you know, one thing when you talk about computer technology, right, it's very dangerous to critique it, because by the time you start, finished you know, writing your article, we already took care of it. Like, I remember it was, it was like, it was a too far, like, remember was this bug in the year 2000 where all, everything was supposed to be destroyed? You know, and when it kind of didn't happen. So, um, uh, but I want to be critical, right? And I think I was critical enough in my talk, but it's also, it's very difficult, right? To, I mean, it's very, it's very difficult to know, right? Which things are going to be where, which are things are systematic, deep issues, which will remain where for many years or decades, and which things will, will be taken care of. Uh, but, you know, uh, uh, when I came to New York, right? So I was offered a position at CUNY Graduate Center. Before I was a professor of digital art for 20 years. And we said, no, we don't have digit, we don't have art, design, architecture, media. And at this point, I should have said, no, I don't take it, but I, but I made a mistake. Mm -hmm. We said, do you want to go into art history or computer science? We have to attach you somewhere. I said, if I go to art history, we probably hate digital, you know, but we, you know, we wouldn't tell me to my face, but we're all like going like this. So I went to computer science, and uh, which is funny, is I'm a professor of computer science. I never took computer science class in my life, but you know, but I meet around enough computer scientists. You know, we are smart people, so so lots of things will be taken care of. But there's a larger issue, right? How do you prevent people from copying 
of these cliches, right? From generating these cute characters. Mm -hmm. uh, how, do you, how do you assure more diversity in global visual culture? Yesterday, I was doing another talk, and there was a very smart guy from Brazil. He said, Lev, let's develop Amazonian AI, right? Let's develop AI which is specific to Brazil. I said, but it's not, I said, yes, you can do it very easily, but it's not going to assure more diversity as long as the people in Brazil are looking at the same global Instagram as everybody else, will be generating the same stereotypes. Sure. So we can, take, we, can take, we can take care of biases in technology. How do we, how do we kind of uh, take care of, of, of stereotypes uh, in where people's head? And if I can just say one more thing. Uh, you know, when globalization started 30 years ago, right? I mean, many of us were watching it. You know, first I thought it would lead to right, more cultural diversity because every culture will eject its own DNA. Well, it's very hard to know how to measure it, but the feeling I have, right, that in fact, you know, we have less diversity perhaps, right? We have particular models, and these models, I don't mean technical models, but particular types of design, this kind of soft minimalism, particular type of food, particular type of music, you know, spread like wildfire. And I was trying to figure out why it didn't happen. And a few months ago, I finally got my answer. So I was reading, sorry for taking time, but it's, it's maybe the most important thing I learned this year. Uh, and it's almost over, right? So you know, people say like 10 things, you know, 10 books I read this year, this is the most important thing I realized. So biologists say that if you want to see really diverse ecosystems, we have to sometimes be kind of separate from everywhere else. Like, like a Galapagos, like, sorry, Gal Galapagos, no, Galapagos. Galapagos Island, right? So, so, so it has like a most amazing, like, right, very rich ecosystem because it's kind of separate. And this is what they had during Cold War, right? You know, the communist countries have their own kind of ecosystem, West, etc. But so the problem of globalization, right? We can get rid of all these islands. And at least, I mean, again, I'm not talking about like all folk traditions, but I'm talking about urban, so-called urban culture, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, Instagram, Facebook, you know, K-pop, Hollywood, Bollywood, et cetera. It basically became like one big, one big continent. And as a result, almost, in almost, almost like in a scientific way, the diversity, I think, have decreased. So, 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 that's, so that's why I want to say the largest question, right? And the same thing goes about future photography, right? It's not about whether AI will replace photographers, of course not. It's whether we'll have diverse photographic imaginations or uh, just as uh, obvious tools will, will, will help to decrease diversity, right? Uh, so that's what's really important, I think. Yeah. Right, so, so maybe it's the computer scientists who lack the diversity in the first place in their tools. Um, a little bit, well, uh, which is I to mean, say, like they'll fix it, or they'll, they say they'll I mean, fix look, it later. You can do kind of, right? I can do kind of cultural analytics on these prompts, on these images, and I can generate statistics, right? Which will say, okay, let's say I can build a system. In fact, I made a proposal to do the system. I got my money, but when we didn't give me money, it was in, it was in Russia. So anyway, uh, uh, ta -ta -ta. so basically, the idea was like you type, you type, let's say, prompt. And the system will say, well, this this kind of terms have been used by so many millions of people, mm -hmm. but if you want something different, let us suggest. It's the same thing as recommendation systems, right? Sure. Recommendation systems are fine-tuned, not just only to offer you what you like, but to also extend, right, extend your, uh, your aesthetic taste, because if the system only offers you what you like, actually you will not use it. Uh, so, so recommendation system, you know, Spotify, YouTube, et cetera, there has been experiments which prove when people use recommendation systems, they potentially actually listen to my music or watch a different type of content. So, so it's very technically very easy to you know, build this kind of tools, right, which will monitor you and say, well, you're just doing another statistical image, why don't you do something else? But if it, it's going to be enough funding to build these tools, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Because you couldn't build these tools in any digital software a long time ago, right? You couldn't right. build it in the Photoshop, but of course nobody did this. Because this is not thought to be an economically important issue. <laughs> It'll be interesting to see if we move away from this kind of commercial bias, because that's the part that's really clear, and that's that's kind of like creating this kind of boring aesthetic or this predictability behind it, because it's popular. And it, we talked about this in terms of yeah. like highly produced. Everything looks highly produced. Yeah. And that tends to be a preference, right. because that's what globally we're becoming used to, things that mm -hmm. look really polished. Right. And so the level of difficulty you could see with those buckets Right? Yes. Oh, this looks more difficult to create, so of course I prefer that, right? Yes. Like this yeah. image, I want so that. In popular culture, people think of figurative painting as art more than abstract, 
because, because it's more difficult, right? In many, many experiments, people prefer figurative art to abstract art because we think it's more difficult to produce. But I also just want to say, you know, with this overproduced kind of like over Photoshop aesthetic, it's not new to our time. I mean, go to Matt, look at Fraganar. Fraganar is complete Instagram. I mean, go, go to, I mean, look at Rubens, right? I mean, this kind of kitschy commercial aesthetics was always present in human culture, even before culture industry. So it's not exactly something which appeared in the century, unfortunately, right? So for every, you know, for every, uh, for every Giacometti and for every, uh, you know, uh, et cetera, whereas like, there's tons of Picasso who do their kitschy stuff, right? So it's always been around. Sure. Um, so because we're talking about photography, and photography ended up being somewhere in the middle there in terms of level of difficulty yeah. and interest or whatever, yes. um, I wanted to talk about the images that I shared um, from your series, because those were these yeah. historical fictions. And I think that's a really interesting exercise, not just to sort of test how the system can interpret history and geography and social, critical, political, whatever. Um, but also because I wanted to talk about how you generated those images, not just through the prompt, but then the images we looked at weren't these raw images from Mid Journey. They were, they were I don't know, processed using Lightbox or something. Uh, you mean Lightroom? Oh, sorry, Lightroom, yes. Yeah. Um, well, so here's a interesting thing, right? So of course my prompt is much longer, and it did include very particular aesthetic and atmospheric terms. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I thought, you know, I made one with, I think, Journey version three, right? So faces often anatomically are not correct, but I, I don't notice this, because the atmosphere captured in these images, you know, the kind of feeling of this, you know, dull, late communist society in kind of this melancholia, uh, but also with something very rational about these faces. Like, I think the system captured it perfectly. So you can take this image, you can make it postage stamp, and it definitely, it would feel to me like the classrooms where I went when I was in 10th grade in Moscow in 1976, but maybe my memory is completely wrong, because I don't have any images from this period, because photoculture you know, was not as spread out in the Soviet Union. Not many people had uh, cameras. Like, I didn't know any, I mean, only recently I learned that there was a whole movement of amateur filmmaking, 8 millimeter. I didn't even know about it. Uh, so I only have like five images from my whole life in Russia uh, before we left. Uh, so to me, we feel very authentic, but it's also maybe like my fantasy. Maybe I'm reading it into them. And uh, what I want to mention, like I would have showed you an example, but we had to change computers. So the latest version of the journey, version four, it greatly increased realism. So images now come out almost like photographs, but when I typed exactly the same prompt, you know, uh, a group portrait of Russian students in the 10th grade, you know, February, uh, February 1st, you know, 8 a.m. lighting, you know, like I, I use my, for example, I found the system understands time, so if you want particular light, you say 7 a.m., so I have all these tricks. It came out with something really different. It came out with images which basically look like top Russian models. Right? Like, what's interesting about these faces, you know, they're not, they're not as idealized, right? Uh, they're not very detailed, but they're more, a bit more realistic. But now, at the expense, right, now there is more detail, but the images are just like completely with perfect Aryan, you know, perfect Slavic models. Uh, and also, there's one more thing, as many of you noticed. So supposedly, you have access to the earlier models, one, two, three, four. But whenever I take a prompt, and I type it, put it in the box a few weeks later. Sometimes I get the same images, sometimes I can never get them again. So I keep saving thousands of thousands. So somehow the systems, even though we're supposed to be, have this backward memory, we kind of don't. Uh, and, uh, but just to come back to your larger question, I think, so I wrote, right, with all media technologies, they've always acted as uh, memory machines. In fact, photography, right? You know, right, what was different about photography from you know, painting, etching, and so on, is that it became this instant memory machine, and whatever was captured is captured, whatever wasn't captured is not captured, same as film. Uh, and then computer graphics, when it started to use in the century to do these historical reconstructions, you go to some, you know, website, or you go to some museum, where computer graphics can become another memory machine, and this will also become another memory machine, right? So let's say, you know, somebody wants to, you know, make a simulation or wants to have a perfect photograph of how her bedroom looked when she was you know, in high school in New York in the 1970s, 
what you'll get may be a bit more generic in reality, but also what you get, of course, will depend on how many historical photographs are available online. So there's way more photographs or video available online about New York in 1981 than Moscow in 1981. And what's available about Moscow, when we need to put like Moscow or Russia in a Google search, you immediately get images of churches and also Red Square. Because either, you know, the, the, you know, the official kind of photo agencies we're putting out these images, and also foreign correspondents who travel to Russia also photograph them. And uh, the images of like everyday life are much rarer. You can find lots of images of people like in long line to buy something, right? About how bad communism was, and it was. Yeah, I mean, it was. It took me an hour in standing in line to buy like potatoes. It's true, uh, but uh, but the everyday life was not as documented, right? So this very, so this inequality, right? This uh, kind of biases or unequal distribution of historical memory we have will also, you know, will also influence the systems. And I wonder if it's possible to almost create some kind of foundation which will say, okay, we're going to generate synthetic but realistic images of particular places, particular ethnicities, and then use it for these data sets. Right, to fill in that gap. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yeah? To kind of, because, you know, to almost like make these images but audit them, right? To have a historians look at them and say, yeah, this is how New York looked in 1981. Let's put this in a database, right? But it's also drawing on not just other photographic images, but drawings, renderings, well, other. It's whatever it is. It's yeah, whatever, whatever it is. Whatever yeah. It is. Yeah, but you can see that, you know, the, yeah, I mean, I, mean, I, don't, I haven't seen actually many drawings in this, in this data set. That maybe we got filtered out. Not sure. Right. Yeah. So that's interesting. What gets yeah. filtered out? That was that was yeah, what yeah, I wanted yeah, to know yeah. in terms of noise. Okay. Um, but in addition to that, I want to talk a little bit about feedback loops because yes. we talked about the kind of broader effect of the feedback loop, the social mechanism around it, which we see online anyway. Sure. You copy sure. what other people's what other people are doing, or you sort of devise an ideal um, starting point. Yeah. But I want to talk about feedback loop with feedback loops within your own registered account. Um, so yeah. first of all, you have to register. So you become yeah. this like recipient. You have this, you know, kind of an archive that's yes. piling up. And right. how does that work, technically speaking? Sure. Is it learning from you as you're inputting, uh, and then like inform, like whatever you did yes. yesterday, is that going to inform what what yes. you get today in yes. terms of synthesis? So this is one of the most mysterious questions about the systems, and we have to remember that you know every company has this maybe maybe somewhat different implementation. So what I definitely notice, and, I, and I, like I see users discussing on the forum, so some people say, no, the system doesn't learn from you, so every time it just comes, starts from scratch. And now people say, you know, I was generating something, particular content last week, and now like I want to generate landscape, like, but, but, but like a kind of face I was generating last week appears in this landscape. I definitely notice from time to time, mm -hmm. right? So I was generating one kind of image, even a few hours later, like I switched to a different genre, like you know, landscapes, and suddenly I saw, t I saw like some, some iconography from early images which had very different prompt. So, so, so that's a kind of interesting, that's an interesting kind of loop. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's an interesting loop. I mean, nobody, like the companies didn't, didn't deny it and we didn't confirm it, so we don't know. Uh, uh, but of course, of course, you know, lots of, right, of course, our digital culture, uh, is based on systems which learn from you, right? So when you get a new iPhone or any phone, you start typing. Sometimes, right, the system doesn't know what key you pressed, and over time it learns, right? So you know, this uh, learning, right, the learning and fine tuning based on your preference, based on your behavior, is built all over digital culture. Uh, where it's built here or where it's going to be built here, we don't know. And of course, what I would like to see, right, uh, in a kind of modernist fashion, is the system which will Right, periodically, you say, you know, you already made this image a few weeks ago. Why don't you make something else? Or oh, this image is kind of rare, right? Uh, but when we need to see, what my system will have to be aware of the whole distribution of people generated. So you kind of have to build these analytics mechanisms in. And I don't think any uh, digital service has these mechanisms, right? So for example, when you put things like in Google image search, I mean, there is a Google Trends, right? Where you can put different terms it will show you how many people search for these terms, but it's not integrated into the search box. So people are leaving. I wonder if we should like we should prevent them from leaving by uh, by allowing them to ask questions. Should, yeah, we should. Let's do that. Yeah. Please, of course. Yeah. Are we going to be able to put images in as the prompts? 
You can, I, you can do it. Yes. You can do it. Yeah, you, can, you can do it in all the systems. You can. Yeah. yeah. You can. And so that will create a new language depending upon my selection of images I put in, right? I yes. mean, a new yes. you can put bias. Images, you can put images and you can specify how much the image is going to contribute to the result on a scale of 0 to 1. So the default is 5. Um, Right, so basically if you put, but what's interesting, if you put one, you don't get back exactly the same image, you still yeah, get yeah. something different. I can imagine. Yeah, so, but if you do it systematically, in fact, I learned recently, but you, like, you can actually put up to uh, one of the systems, you can put 40 images in a single prompt. So I wanted, what I want to do is take my drawing, and then do lots of close-ups, then put all those close-ups, and see what, I mean, I, I didn't have a chance to try, I will try, I will try tomorrow morning, I promise, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it is possible, yeah. Um, that's actually one of my favorite ways to use um, AI is inserting images because I find that when you generate a new image from um, your own image, it kind of adds like a genetic variation in a way, and I kind of look at it as like an evo like a way to okay. like evolve your art in a sense, um, and that actually leads me to one of my questions. Um, so. Um, again, like I use it to uh, like get a pair of fresh eyes um, and kind of like see how other people would see my own work. Um, but that made me wonder, uh, is it possible to almost become too dependent on AI if you integrate it in your process? And um, do you think there's a balance in how much you should be integrating AI to your work? You want to? I mean, I have an answer, but do you want to? Go for it. Okay. For sure. So, you know, this uh, summer I was in Berlin, and when I'm in Berlin, I always feel romantic. So I went to this beautiful stationery store, and I bought a beautiful notebook, which was much more expensive than it should have been, and some beautiful Japanese pens. And I started to make drawings, and the first time I returned to drawing practice after 30 years. So 30 years, I was all digital, right? I said, you know, everybody is digital now, but digital culture is everywhere. Uh, but what I can do is I can draw certain worlds, you know, based on my academic training and based on my experience. You know, it was very difficult, but very satisfying. And then after I finished the drawings, I started to use these tools. And I wasn't able to sit down and work on the first drawing since. <laughs> because, of course, in the time it would take me to make an interesting drawing, right, I can try 20 different ideas. But my goal, of course, is to be different. But of course, other people want to do it, is to basically integrate my traditional drawings, uh, the drawings I, I made like in my 20s, and the drawings I'll make now, or you know, paintings, with this synthetic material using Photoshop. And it turns out to be more difficult you know, than I expected, because my idiosyncratic visual language is really different. And also, with the tools, as, as many of you noticed, it's a bit hard to control composition. And also, it's, a, it's not so easy to control exactly, right? You can't say, I want camera like 35 degrees up, right? Or, or dolly here, right? So it's a bit hard to control perspective. Uh, like, I wasn't very successful in generating satisfying isometric images, which also makes it a bit hard. Uh, but definitely, you know, I think we experience many of us had, right, since the summer is like, it's like new drug, right? I mean, you get addicted. And uh, in fact, you know, I will tell you what, 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 what happened to my addiction. I realized I don't want to be Lev Manovich anymore. I don't want to be, I don't want to be media theorist. Because Natasha can do it much better, right? I mean, if I write more books, my, my CUNY is not going to raise my salary because State University. Right? Uh, like, why should I do it? And in the time it takes me to write one article, and English is not my first language, and I usually revise 15 times, I can make so many beautiful images. So I basically announced, like immediately announced on Facebook, guys, I'm coming back to art, and it's been going well, right? I was, I was participating in three exhibitions, my work has been written about, and exactly six weeks after I started posting my images, I, I was invited next year to have a big personal show in a, important cultural center in Portugal. So now I would have to fill 1,300 square meters. So the response was very good. So in my case, it basically, it basically convinced me that but Lev Manovich should just retire. I mean, I will write some theory and I will post it online, but this is just so much fun. Uh, in fact, 
I, I don't remember last time. Because also, you know, the problem with using digital tools, right? We are very anal, right? Like you can't, you can't, you know, you know how like you can't do Jackson Pollock, right, with Photoshop. You just break the computer, right? You can't be like Francis Bacon who would make a painting and then take like a you know, piece of cloth and load it with paint and kind of throw it, right, on the canvas. Like everything is inches, pixels, right? Every tool has all these controls. And, uh, you know, so it's like nobody built a different interface to creation tools, right? Like, and at least I think, I think one of the things which is very really nice about the system like, you know, I don't have to, sp I don't have to, right, like, go to Photoshop brushes, select this brush, even think about what's the hardness parameter, what transparency, I just type a prompt, right? So in a way, yeah, this is not Pollock, but I don't want to be Pollock anyway, right? I don't want to be, like, on my force, you know, et cetera. Uh, I, want to, I want to be, like, you know, maybe uh, Soutin. <laughs> but, but in a way, the fact that you don't have to fine tune all the different things and the interface natural language, it's a, it's a really new interface for digital creation. In a way, it's much more... It's much lighter. It's much lighter, right? Uh, because you don't have to specify with different things, whether it is Photoshop, Maya, Houdini, AutoCAD, and so on. So I think this may almost be the opposite question of, of the last one, which was, can this be too seductive and can contaminate the practice? This morning, I use Dolly all the time. And my assistant and I, this morning, uh, he was showing me an image he made. And what he had done was he didn't like the image that Dolly had created exactly the way it was, so he remade it a little differently by hand. And I said to him, and I don't know if this is in your wheelhouse, even this question, but I said, well, if you really like the first version they gave you, which he didn't, but just theoretically speaking, and you printed it out, could you sign it? Is it yours or is it Dolly 2's? And I imagine that's still like up for grabs about who controls yeah, well, the I mean, image. Yeah, but it seems to be one of the, I mean, the question about copyright is very important because some artists realize that their images, their styles are used very prominently but, you know, by users. And also, I mean, that's a question which I think accompanied computer art for a while. And I wonder, like, you know, I'm not the expert in the history of photography, so I wonder when photography appeared, right, which was this alien technology of 19th century, was there a debate about who is the author? Because now the image is produced by this, and again, like, I don't know if there are any experts uh, uh, on the, you know, 1840s or 1860s, so I wonder if it's kind of, this kind of idea, right, that now uh, we're producing something with the help of technology, therefore we're not the single authors anymore. I wonder if it's like something which only, uh, this idea only appeared with, with AI and digital art. I wonder if it always accompanied every new technology. Uh, Natasha, you have something? Yeah, well, I'm thinking about um, just the use of software in general. I'm thinking about Corey Archangel's Photoshop series the, that could easily be recreated with the same a uh, set of instructions, right? And that was the, the titles that he used for each of his works and printed them out like that. And it, I think of it as a similar thing. I think the art is in the prompt at that point. Now, if you're copying and pasting prompts, I don't know, then it gets complicated. Um, or buying a prompt, for example, then I feel like credits need to be made um, to whoever else accompanied the creation. But I think these are the, the questions that we're confronting and maybe don't have clear answers for. But I do think, you know, we do have a model in place for using tools and systems that are doing much of the creative work uh, for us, right? Mm -hmm. okay. Oh, sir, okay, yeah, yeah, go ahead. There is an answer to your question that Dolly has a guideline and you're supposed to state it's a collaboration between Dolly and the name of the person writing the prompts. It's, there's a guideline for it. There's no, it's not ambiguous at all. I have an ethical question, which I, I think needs to be addressed. Stephen Shore, for example, has started using Dolly and said, make an image in the style of Stephen Shore, mm -hmm. which are quite good. Now, if I was to start making images in the style of Charles Traub and do a show of 200 images in the style of Charles Traub, I find there's an ethical issue of, you know, you're talking about Soutine, you're talking about Pollock, these are dead artists. But it's equally easy to 
copy and, and, and actually amplify any living artist and make hundreds or thousands of images, flood the market, and either diminish the original or enhance the original, whichever way you think about it. But I, I've seen very, very little thinking about what the ethics are of using this in terms of living artists. So I'd be, you know, I'd be interested in a response. I I mean, how can we how can we begin to question ethics in the in this process? It's only when money becomes involved that it becomes a more ethical question. No, I'm, I'm a writer. If somebody started using an AI system and writing books in my style, I would be very offended. And if I put a paragraph of your writing into the Dada poem generator that's been online for 15 years and output it and signed it, maybe cited you, would you have an issue with me making a poster of it? I, I think you're mixing what I'm saying. I'm saying if I spend seven years writing a book and then somebody spends 10 minutes writing a book in my style, to me... Uh, style or content? That's right. Yeah. Well, wait, wait, wait. Yes. What I'm, I've been using Dali a lot. I've, I've made images in the style of dozens and dozens of artists, photographers, and so on. And many of them are really extraordinary. So then it's fine to do it to anybody. So, so you're me, saying if you're under 40, it's fine. If you're over 40, it's not. Is that what you're saying? This goes back to hip hop. This goes back to mixtape culture. You know, the record companies are going to have to say, "Look, this is So, so I don't think we're going to resolve these questions, which are very important, you know, and uh, you know, conceptual art and hip hop. But I think I think the question is, I mean, for me, the interesting question would be, since you know, these practices of appropriation or copying have been, you know, as 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 long as humans created culture, right? So probably the first drawing made on a cave wall in. Uh, 115,000 years ago, he was already copying somebody, right? <laughs> or she, right? I'm sure. I think we, I mean, maybe we useful question which we can tackle if you want. Do this, does this new AI uh, image making, media making paradigm bring something new to the process of a question besides simply speed, right? So is there some quali uh, qualitative change besides quantitative? And I personally, in this respect, I don't see any qualitative change. Uh, but of course, when you do can do something super quickly, it also sometimes, as we know from Hegel, right, quantity can become quality, right? But I don't see some. Please go ahead. You want microphone? Oh, I, I, I'm okay with you okay? That actually, that actually leads to a question that I do have. We can't hear you. Okay. The the question that I do have is that the foremost sneaker company in the world during COVID produced 781,395 images in a year. 3,300 images, 3,311 images per day, and 414 images of sneakers per hour. How is this going to keep up with that, on the one hand? And ultimately, can we as educators foresee this as a tool being integrated into the workforce that we are, in part, educating? Don't we owe it to foresee much in the way the bandsaw or the CNC router or the jackhammer shifted paradigms in labor and what lies ahead? Can we speculate on that at all yet, or are these questions well, that we need in, to in, in fact, work uh, In fact, you, know, you guys are so nice. You're too nice, because you should have said, 
Lev and Natasha, you guys are full of shit because with the title announced, you'll be talking about future. And we, ca we completely focus on the present. So I think Natasha has wonderful thing to say about future. <laughs> we do want to, no, no, because sorry, we should at least try a little bit, right? Because otherwise, like, you know, otherwise somebody will sue me that I didn't talk what, what we talk on us. Well, I want to back up a little bit too. Just, no, no, no. But I do want to back up a little bit. I think it's a fair question. I think I think we do have some ethical concerns. Maybe not about copying so much. You know, Sherry Levine, Michael Mandelberg, people like this, Richard Prince, as was mentioned. Um, you know, we have a, a model for that, and and there's something to say for the copy and what what that ads as far as like a cultural interpretation, um, adding your name to a conversation, um, maybe even dismantling the predecessor in some way or another, uh, whatever those conditions are. So there's interesting things to say about that. But I'm also thinking about sort of the conditions around what it means to generate new images and how these data sets, and this is why I was asking about that, we don't choose to be part of the data sets, right? Our images are already whoever you are, whether you're famous or not, our images are part of these data, data sets. You can, you can count on that. Um, they're scraping millions of data from, you know, images from the web and uh, these databases that exist. And so if you are famous and this is your livelihood, you know, there is something to, to think about in terms of what that means for you and your future when your style maybe isn't copied exactly, but becomes the basis for this training model that makes it really easy for someone who has no technical expertise to jump in. So those are definitely questions I don't think we have answers for, but they're worth talking about. Great. And I want to add something. So I think many people, right, uh, have a, not you guys, you guys smart, it's in New York, but, but not, somewhere like, you know, somewhere like we vote for Trump, like these people down there, right? It was, okay, so some people have this idea that, you know, the system just like takes parts of existing images and mixes them. Of course, it's completely way wrong about everything, including this part. So, you know, you can, you can test very easily uh, that the system generates something original, even though it may not look like, right? So what I do is I made some images with like my journey, and when I did reverse Google image search, and it didn't find anything exactly like this, right? Because the whole thing, the system generates new images. What's also important, like, you know, if you say ta-ta-ta in the style of X, it looks very easy. But as you just pointed out, like there are uh, almost six billion image text pairs in the data set, and every image contributes something. And the thing about neural networks, right, it's, it's impossible to analytically understand what we're doing, right, because there are trillions of weights. So in a way, uh, while this idea that you, you can, the system can copy artist style is, is obvious, but less obvious is every, everybody contributes. Just as, you know, the way Google search works, right, we're capturing what everybody types, and then we're capturing what link you type, and then this is used to improve the search. So every time, right, people said every time, you know, you use Google, you help them. Even Google said, okay, we're going to offer you a different search engine where you have to pay, when nobody was using it. Um, so that's also very important. But I want to try, uh, maybe with your help, Natasha help, try to speculate a little bit about the future. So let's imagine that the system progresses, but a year from now you can make, I mean, I didn't talk about it, but you can also generate from text prompts, you can generate already 3D shapes, you can generate uh, short videos. Uh, in fact, like, I mean, I have links, but no, 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 I don't have machine here to show them, uh, right? So, so image generation, it excites us now, but the next year we'll have the same event, we'll be talking about video generation. Uh, and uh, in a way where in a few years, you can sit down, type your prompts and get a Hollywood movie, Maybe yes, maybe it will take seven years, maybe even 13, but things are going in this direction. So when the question becomes, right, the professionals have always separated themselves from amateurs by more expensive equipment, like 35 millimeter you know, film versus eight millimeter, and also by, by, kind of, by, by training, right, by aesthetics, you know, clean sound, right, Back, you know, background music, et cetera, right? You can make, you know, you can make now a movie with an iPhone, but if you want to produce professional sound, you need a sound studio. So now we actually potentially at a point, if we extrapolate today with in you know, X number of years, anybody, let's assume that anybody can sit down, where we have prompt interface, or maybe you draw a sketch, you know, and when you get perfect photograph by any top, you know, commercial fashion photographer, or you get like, you know, perfect Hollywood movie, what happens to professionals, right? 
uh, and I think it's interesting to speculate about it because I think this extreme scenario may become reality. I don't know if in two years, five years, 50 years, but uh, relatively soon, like, yeah, because, because you can see how quickly the system are um, improving. So one possibility, one answer I can give you, but it's a very sad answer, that professional photographer will be just somebody who just photographing lots of sets and just creating like images which go into a database used to train the system. Uh, and then the system can produce much better images than any living photographer or any living artist. I mean, well, of course, art is not about good images, art is about concepts, sorry, right? Uh, so what will happen, uh, you know? Dangerous question. I almost hope, though, that there are things we haven't thought of, like aesthetics that we haven't come up with yet. And that's that's the desire here. What does this medium do that others don't already do? And so we haven't really tapped into that yet, right? We're still experimenting and pushing it and developing the software further, each of these uh, available tools. And so like every other previous medium, you know, it has its own way of doing things. And so I don't think we're, we're right now trying to recreate things that already exist recreate other media that already exist, illustration, or like you talked about, uh, you know, photography, but also concept art, right? That's what it's good at. Well, what else is it good at? What haven't we realized yet about the technology? So, yeah, we have time for maybe one last question. Okay, well, uh, maybe let's take a question. I have an answer, but let's take a question. My concern is that the difference between assistive tools and replacement tools, which is really what you're talking about and certainly what you're talking about in the future. Mm -hmm. My experience with Dolly 2 is it's very bad for what I want. I can't create complicated, I'm a cartoonist, images uh -huh. with uh, constructed the way I would. It, it blends them, it messes them up, but it may not. And Photoshop is clearly an assistive tool. Mm -hmm. And now we're talking about conceivably replacement tools. And that becomes an economic issue, a labor issue, and something that people are legally concerned about now. You know, recently there was this uh, 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 article in the paper, and it's really about computer code, in which uh, uh, OpenAI, uh, through Microsoft, has created Copilot, which helps you write code. And they're being sued now because, but the coders are saying, hey, you looked at all my code here, and now you've created a program which right now is sort of primitive, could it end up completely replacing me? And so it, it's probably going to happen no matter what, but it is a question that really has to be looked at and is very much of concern to creatives at this point. And, and, and for other people, I mean, I enjoy using it. I'm not saying that, but it is, it is coming up. Can we answer, or <laughs> Natasha? No, you want? No, can, can we split it? No? It's okay? You want? No? Go for it. Okay. Well, so this issue, right, the way automation in general, uh, what it does to the jobs, right, it's studied as, you know, by economists, et cetera. It's a very complex issue. So one thing in reading about it, I noticed one thing, one idea I picked up, which I think is very interesting and optimistic, right? So while so the new technologies, which are based on computers, uh, right, they do uh, you know make certain professions, certain jobs obsolete. Like, you know, travel agents, right? Remember, 20, 20 years ago, you always go to travel agents. Like, now you're like, all right, maybe some people still do, you know? Uh, but at the same time, they create new jobs. Right? So think about, like, okay, the computer animation, I was lucky to work in one of the first studios which was doing computer animation in New York, it was called Digital Effects 84. It was 50 people, all the people who did computer animation at the time, you can put them in this room. Now there are hundreds of thousands and millions of people doing, you know, characters rendering, right? Think about the game industry, right? So, but for this to happen, uh, the, this AI systems, right? It's not about replacing photography, painting. It's almost we have to create the all new genres of culture. And when people can work in the genres, right? So hope it will happen, but right now, right? Because it's been only a few months, it's very early to say, right? So 3D computer graphics eventually led to, whether we like it or not, you know, virtual worlds and metaverse, right? It created a new cultural medium, right? Uh, you know, let's say uh, OVR. 
So will this AI thing create its own new cultural medium, or will it only be replacing professionals everywhere? That remains to be seen, right? And that's very interesting. I think that's maybe a positive way to think about it, I hope. Hello? So everybody become conceptual artists. <laughs> I, I, I'm afraid we have to end because the staff here, but yeah. I just want to thank everybody who participated, came, particularly Natasha and Lev. Um, this is just the beginning of our discussions about these issues. They're going to grow. They're going to be complicated. I just remember everybody saying when we started going digital in 88, oh, it'll be 50 years, you know. And all the same people said that, can I take a course in your department? You know, Photoshop, you only have limited resources. Digital printing will never replace black and white printing, blah, 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 blah. We don't know what's going to happen. But at any rate, on March 18th, you can put this in your calendar, we're going to have a full day symposium on all these subjects, the legal, the ethical, the moral, the commercial, the aesthetic. Natasha and Adam Bell are putting this together, certainly with Lev and with Fred Richin will be involved and others. Um, so put it in your calendar. It will be in the big theater here. And uh, hope to see you all back March 18th for a whole day session. Thank you for coming. Thank you, everybody. everybody.